Hello everyone and welcome to Handmade Hero, the show where we code a complete game live on stream. Yesterday we implemented depth peeling and surprisingly uh, it all went very well. So it took a lot less time than I thought it would um, because since we don't have the ability to debug the GPU on this machine, I thought we were going to end up with a lot of black box debugging to get that working, but it turned out really that wasn't the case at all. However, uh, we do still have something to debug for today, which is the part that comes after the depth peeling, which is the thing that composites the two depth peel uh, results back together again into a final image. That is the only thing that, as far as I know anyway, that we have uh, now to get working that we didn't have working before. Uh, and so that's what we're working on today. Uh, this is going to be a black box debugging session, though, as I had feared we would have to do during the death peeling, but didn't have to. Uh, because, again, we don't have the ability to debug anything on this machine. Normally, uh, and that's okay because it's good to show this sort of thing, because sometimes uh, when you are programming, uh, if you are an engine programmer, as is what we do on the stream, uh, it is not always the case that you have good tools. A lot of times you may be given a development environment to work with uh, on, say, a new console that's coming out or something like this where the state of the tools is very poor and you don't have a lot in the way of debugging and you just have to make do with what you have. And so this is not, well, while it's not really the way you should go about doing GPU programming on the PC these days because you could just go buy an NVIDIA card and use Ensight um, to do your basic debugging, uh, it's not the case that this kind of debugging is dead forever or anything like that. Uh, black box debugging is definitely the kind of thing uh, that always comes back and rears its ugly head and probably will for as long as we still have technological progress uh, in the hardware space because the bottom line is tools don't always come online as quick as you might want. And so at least when you're on the front lines of development, you find yourself in positions where you have to do debugging without real debuggers fairly often. So that's the position we find ourselves in today. But fortunately for us, as I said, the depth feeling part of things went relatively smoothly, and that's probably the more complicated one to debug. Because here we are not comparing depth values or anything like that. We're just dealing with taking two color buffers and merging them together. So hopefully this will not be particularly complicated by comparison, but again, it will still be something we have to do in a black box fashion. If you're starting um, to debugging with me today, uh, today is day 382, so you'll want to start with day 381 source code for this debugging. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at where we left things. Uh, I can sort of show you uh, the situation as it stands. Uh, let me go ahead and open for a coder up here and our project. Here we go. And now I will run it. And uh, basically what we're seeing here is we just have a black screen if we actually run uh, the final composite the way that it is currently written, right? That's the bug is we're not seeing anything. So something is like just fundamental is wrong with that call. Now, if we look, and just to give you a refresher in case you don't remember or weren't here yesterday uh, with where we're at, we have produced two frame buffers. And here is a blit of the first frame buffer that we have produced. And what this is, is it's just the frontmost pixel. So using the Z buffer, uh, we feed all of the sprites and all of the ground cubes, right? We feed all those to the GPU. We let it use the Z buffer to pick whichever one is closest. And we just keep the closest. So there is no blending happening here, just the closest. And you can see that the fringing, uh, the, the sort of black pixel fringing, you can see where the shadows would be is all black, right? And that's because those are all alpha values. They have an alpha of something. Uh, but they're not blending. And this is important. That's what we wanted. We wanted a frame buffer that just had the color values of the frontmost pixel and the alpha value of the frontmost pixel. So that's what's in frame buffer zero. Then frame buffer one is the other frame buffer we produced. Uh, and what that is, is it's whatever the one pixel behind the front bu buffer pixel was. So we render the scene twice. We render it first to get that front pixel and then to get the pixel that's one behind whatever that front pixel was. And you can see what that going on here. You can see right here uh, a good example of that. Here are those trees that we were seeing. Instead of seeing the trees, we're seeing the ground plates behind the tree, right? Uh, and so we're seeing straight through uh, the where the tree's outline was. 
And then where the trees were not, we're seeing beyond the ground, right? Because the ground was there, so now we're seeing what was behind the ground. And so that's exactly what we wanted. These two frame buffers look basically right. They basically look what I wanted. Um, and so now our challenge is to take these two frame buffers, which appear to have been generated correctly, and we need to merge them together so that we can output the final result, which is the front buffer blended with the back buffer based on that front buffer's alpha value. That's all we're trying to do. Very, very simple two texture blend where we take, uh, you know, you might think of it as a decal blend. It's basically we're taking one texture and stamping it onto the other texture using the alpha value of the first texture to determine how much blending there should be. That's all we're doing. Uh, we're not doing anything else. So it's pretty straightforward, but uh, we've got some problems here. What the first thing that I, I quickly hacked this in at the end of uh, last stream, so it's not like we spent a lot of time on it. We may find that there was just some very basic, simple mistake, uh, but we have to figure out what's going on. So here's what we know so far. Um, we have set ourselves up to try and pull from two textures uh, and draw a single full screen uh, quad, which is obviously going to get drawn as two triangles since uh, graphics cards don't draw quads, they draw triangles. Uh, well, most of the time they do. Cards have implicit rasterizers on them, and I think nowadays you could probably draw a quad if you really wanted to. I don't know how much they expose that, but that's neither here nor there. The point is simply that uh, this will get drawn as two triangles. We're outputting it as a triangle strip because there is no such thing as GL quads in modern OpenGL. After you move away from uh, compatibility mode, they got rid of quads entirely. I have no idea why they got rid of quads entirely. I literally could not tell you. Uh, all I can say is that uh, they don't have that anymore. So we're drawing a triangle strip. That triangle strip uh, consists of the four corners of the screen. And uh, it's using a shader called Peel Composite, which we wrote, uh, whose only job is to pull from these two textures that were the frame buffers we just looked at and draw them to the screen. Now, what we know uh, from, from just a few experiments last time, and I can show you this, uh, if I set the clear color um, here, and clear the uh, color buffer, what we will see is that we do at least get a red screen. And what that tells me, uh, at least for the most part, because if I was to take, like, you know, let's say I took this GL viewport call, and again, just we're just playing around with this just to sort of make sure we know what we're doing here. Uh, if I was to sort of play with this call, I just want to see if the viewport, because I don't know if the viewport uh, the GL clear actually obeys the viewport, and it looks like it doesn't. If I remember correctly, and I don't know if I really do, um, the only way to get clearing to respect the viewport is to actually have GL scissor enabled. Um, so if I want to play around with that, I would have to sort of play uh, with these two here and, and put a scissor on as well. Uh, so let's go ahead and see uh, what that does here. Okay. Uh, so let me go ahead and, and let me divide the width here just to see, because I want to I wanna make sure we know where our viewport actually is and that our viewport is correct, because I don't know if it is or if it isn't. Okay. Um, so what I want to do here is I just want to ensure uh, that there's some, sort, some semblance, anyway, uh, of, of an understanding that we're setting the viewport correctly. So what I'm doing here is I'm just playing with the parameters to the viewport and scissor call because I want to see that we've got that viewport set up properly, right? Um, and that's, did I, did I accidentally type width in for one of those? I think I may have. Uh, so there's Jill scissor, draw region min. Let me take, let me just back out here a little bit. There we go. That should be like that. I don't know why I typed divided by four there. Nobody knows. Um, so that's what I wanted to see. Again, this is just me, because you know, black box debugging, everything's on the table. We don't know what's wrong, right? I know I've made a mistake somewhere, or there's a driver bug somewhere. Like we don't even know if it's our mistake, but it's probably our mistake because we're not doing anything particularly complicated, right? But either way, it doesn't matter. There is a mistake somewhere. Ours or theirs, we don't know anything about where it is. So I'm just starting from first principles and going, OK, let me verify that I even know where I am drawing to. So with a, with a clear of red uh, of the color buffer bit and a viewport plus a scissor, 
I can guarantee that now I at least know what the boundaries of the drawing region are. Because when I was seeing the whole screen red, I had no way of knowing whether I was just seeing like a giant viewport that extended way beyond the screen and that we're just clearing a small portion of it, or whether I was actually looking at the whole screen. It looks like it was correct that the viewport was just the screen. I'm going to leave these in place and just try to get the draw working to that smaller area um, for the time being. OK. Uh, so I want to look at a couple things here, uh, but again, the first first things first. I'm going to switch this clear now over to blue, so that when it clears, it's going to going to show blue, um, and then I'm going to use red as the color that I draw in the shader. So I'm going to pop over to the shader now, uh, and I'm going to I'm going to simplify the shader down uh, until I know that the shader does literally nothing. Oops, I'm in the wrong file. Uh, until I know that the shader does literally nothing but draw red. Right? I don't want the shader to do anything, basically, other than output bright red, OK? Uh, so what I want to do here is say, all right, uh, let's make sure that we are always drawing pure red out. And it looks like that's basically what we're doing here. But I want to be even more explicit about it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and I'm going to completely nerf everything in the shader. So there's literally nothing in the shader now. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the shader explicitly uh, to a full alpha red color. Um, and that result color is the only out we put. So it should just draw pure red. And if we go up here and look at the vertex shader, the vertex shader just takes the position directly uh, and outputs it. So hopefully that as well uh, would be a, uh, a clear and uh, unambiguous shader. So now I have to see if it gives me any errors, because I'm not using any of those values. It isn't, so in theory, that shader is compiled properly. Again, that's just you know in theory. Uh, so now what we should see is this, this uh, program that we've created is something that should just draw red wherever it is. right? So it doesn't matter what you send down. Wherever it fills, uh, regardless of what the texture values are, we should just see red. And the reason that I'm doing that is again, I want to take as much stuff out of the equation as possible. And I just want to get it to where I see something red, right? Because we know now that we're drawing to the right area viewport wise. But what we don't know is whether we're ever actually drawing anything through the shader. And since the shader is set to pure red, and I'm not seeing any red on the screen at all, I can only assume that what I'm seeing here is some kind of a problem with the way I'm specifying the vertices. Like they're not actually being set uh, to what I expect them to be or something, right? Now, the other thing I can do here uh, is I can clear everything. So I can clear the, the, uh, the depth bit uh, and the stencil bit. Oops. Uh, and what that'll do is just verify, you know, I thought I turned depth testing off. In theory, depth testing should be off. I just want to make sure. And by clearing the depth buffer first, I know that there's no Z buffer getting in the way. And I've disabled the depth, depth, depth test here. So in theory, that should not be a problem. But I just want to make absolutely positive. OK. All right. So now we know we're drawing to the correct frame buffer. And we know we're drawing to the correct region. And the reason we know that is because we see the blue rectangle. So I at least know that much. We are not reading from these textures. So in theory, I can just get rid of these textures entirely because we're not reading from them. Uh, and hopefully, that will ensure that there's nothing weird going on in the texture side of things. Uh, again, those sh calls should have had no effect whatsoever. Uh, and we're not seeing any effect there, so that's good. And so now we're just left with what I think is our fundamental problem and probably the was the original problem altogether, the only problem that I think we actually have so far, which is that I'm not actually specifying vertices correctly. So they're not actually constituting triangles that we can actually see. That is my assumption for what is wrong. But I don't actually know that. That's just my assumption. So what I would like to do here uh, is I would like to go into the use program begin uh, of peel composite. And I'd also like to just verify what some of the values that we're setting are to make sure that they're plausible and that there isn't some kind of an error value somewhere uh, that we're not seeing, right? Um, because even though we have it set up to issue a hard error any time that the OpenGL uh, driver thinks that we've made a critical mistake, we will see those. But 
we could easily get in a situation where it returns a like, oh, I didn't find anything for this vertex uh, stream that you asked for or something. That is maybe a legal pass through error, right? It may be a, not really technically an error, in which case we wouldn't get notified about it or something, right? So I just want to come in here and make sure that the things that we are sending down that I do expect to be set are set. So you can see, for example, transform ID, there is no transform uh, set in this particular shader. So I expect it to be all you know negative one basically, and that's what it is. So that's okay. But for example, this one, um, well, actually these are now because we removed them. So those don't have to get set either. Um, but for example, these right here should have values. And you can see that they actually do appear to have values, like stream zero, stream one, and stream two. Uh, or, or rather location one, one, two, and three, uh, does look correct there. Now, what I don't know, you know, I don't know if location one is the correct location, obviously, because there's no way for me to know that. That's just what it told me. But I assume that that's correct. Um, and, you know, uh, there's, yeah, I assume that that is the correct value. We don't really have any way of knowing. Uh, and so here we go. We're setting offsets into textured vertex. Uh, we're using just the buffer that's already uh, sort of set up here, I believe. Um, although, you know, is this array buffer actually enabled and active? I guess that's one thing I don't know. Let me make sure that we didn't miss something here. So it doesn't look like it because it looks like we leave the, uh, the buffer bound the entire time. Uh, for the most part. So it looks like that should be fine. Uh, I'm assuming that's something that happens in here. Uh, I don't actually know, but let's see. So there's GL gen buffers and there's GL bind buffer. Uh, so it looks like that is just always going to be active. And in theory, uh, there's nothing else we need to really do there. So that I believe uh, should be fine. So it seems like that use program begin is working relatively well. Uh, and it seems like, yeah, I, I don't see any other particularly onerous things happening here. So the next question is, well, are we sending down this vertex data correctly? Because maybe we're doing something stupid where we're not putting the data into, we're not putting the vertex data into a format um, that works properly uh, with the rest of the pipeline. So let's take a look there. Let me uh, break out of this. Uh, and let's just go take a quick look at what we're actually specifying uh, in those terms. So you can see here, if this is the vertex code for our other shader, the one that is working properly, uh, the one that's drawing all the sprites and that's dr even drawing the faces of the cube. So you can see that what happens when we do our vertex in, uh, ingress here is we create a vertex uh, that's basically got Uh, you know what I was just thinking? I don't know if the W coordinate of a vertex defaults to one or not. We're setting it to one here, but we're not setting it to one the other one. And if the W coordinate was zero, that would be a problem potentially for us because a W coordinate of zero that doesn't go through a transform of any kind would end up dividing by zero potentially. Um, so let's just double check that, uh, right? This right here where we specify this vert P it's a v4 incoming. Uh, and you know what? Actually, it wouldn't even be the default value. It's actually going to be a value right here. So I think, I think this is really my mistake. Uh, th this looks very, very much like a suspicious maneuver here. I kind of forgot we had this special vertex format that we've been using to do z-biasing, which means that we actually pass four values, not three, as a position. So it's not even filling in a default value for w, it's filling in our value for w. And what you'll notice here is c will complete an, an incomplete initializer list like this with zeros. And so what we're actually getting is this. And that's a problem because the W coordinate is the synthetic divide that's going to happen with that W coordinate. Uh, that's going to divide by zero and probably not give us very happy results. Uh, so what I would assume is that that right there may be a really big problem for us. Uh, let's see what happens if we re-enable that uh, by, by putting a one in there. So that's looking really good. There we've got red coming. Uh, and I assume that we're actually seeing um, the actual coverage region being the correct, you know, the whole viewport. I'm going to just just see if that's true. Uh, by switching these to something that has just, just a tenth uh, apron there on it, 
right? So we can kind of see what's going on and verify that it actually is drawing to the region I think it's drawing to because again, just like I did when I pushed that viewport in um, smaller than the screen to see that I could see the apron, I wanna do the same thing with the shader to make sure that I know that I'm passing down values that are lining up the way that I think. And so that looks pretty good to me. Uh, it does look like roughly a 10th. Again, that it should not be a symmetric apron. It shouldn't be symmetric because uh, we're talking about clip space where everything's negative one to one. That means motion in X is going to um, be uh, further. It's gonna move further than in Y because there's less total distance that's, that's spanning that negative one to one range. So that looks like a, a fair apron to me. It looks like what I would expect. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and change it back. I think that's looking good. Uh, and I'll also now go back and change uh, the viewport to be specifying the correct viewport region uh, by eliminating these offsets uh, that we had in here and restoring it to uh, the correct, um, oops, uh, restoring it to the correct uh, size. And so now I think if I, I can get rid of that scissor test there as well, uh, and I can also get rid of my clears, and I should now be able to do just a straightforward uh, use of of the shader uh, to draw without any of these other business, right? I should now get a very clean um, result. Okay, so now we're seeing full screen red. That's great. That's what I want to see. That's exactly right. Uh, so now I'm going to take out these ifs. I'm going to allow the textures to get set again. And again, we're not reading from those textures. So at this point, nothing should happen. We should just see a red screen and we do. So those are not interfering, which is great. And now I want to go down here and I want to uh, pull off some of these other uh, things that we had. First of all, I'm going to take out the if zero. Oops, that's the wrong if zero. No, that's the right if zero. Take out the if zero. There we go. Uh, and now we should see again that red uh, with no errors, hopefully. Yep. Uh, and so now I'm going to take away the, the RGBA, uh, the part that's actually doing the, the red right. Um, and now we're gonna see whatever the actual color of the shader is producing, which may be completely wrong. But okay, that's not too bad actually. Uh, it's not what we want, it's obviously still a little wrong, um, but our composite's actually working now, and so that's good news. So now we just have to debug the code in our shader, which is where we wanted to be yesterday when we just kinda hacked it in, if it had worked the first time. If I'd remember that 1.0 in there, all the rest of our code was right. Cheers. Uh, this is water, so I guess you don't technically say cheers, but hey, whatever. Um, so it looks like the good news is almost everything's working correctly. The bad news is uh, we do have some work to do here in terms of uh, figuring out how to do this blend properly and not messing anything up. Uh, so let's start with the basics. Let's start with verifying that we can read from our frame buffers and write uh, the results in without getting anything particularly strange happening. Uh, okay, and so the way that we're gonna do that uh, is in here where I've got my result color.rgb. What I wanna do here is sort of comment out the actual code that's doing anything uh, specific here. And I wanna just take a look at what peel zero is, right? Um, because that's that first frame buffer that should just have uh, exactly what, yeah. So you can see already we're off to a bad start in terms of our data uh, because I'm looking at something here that's clearly not the right color values. And so we have a, a question to ask ourselves first, which is why is our peel zero value uh, coming out wrong? And what I wonder here is I wanna make sure that we're not, it, it, this is probably an sRGB issue of some kind, although I don't really know. Uh, so what I wanna, I, I got some work to do here to figure out why we're seeing this sort of errant color uh, stuff going on. So the first thing I wanna do is I wanna take out the possibility that any of this other nonsense that we're doing is actually causing a problem. So what I wanna do is I'm just gonna comment out, well, not really comment out, I'm going to if zero out, uh, the code that does the you know sRGB conversion, just in case somehow those got set. Now they shouldn't be set as far as I know. Um, Ooh, although they may be getting set. Uh, more on that in a minute, actually. Um, yeah, uh, there's, there's some complexity there. Uh, okay, so you can see that we get the right results there. So when I was about to say this shouldn't do anything, I was like, glad I tested it, because I'm like, no, it did do something. So what I was about to say when I kind of was like, it won't do anything, and then immediately thought, oh wait, maybe it will. 
if you remember correctly, AMD kind of gave us uh, the middle finger a little bit before because we had tried to create our frame buffers with an sRGB format, but it wasn't letting us do that when we were in multi-sample land, right? Um, if you remember correctly. However, now we've got a case where we're mixing textures and frame buffers together and the frame buffers that are doing the writes, those didn't have sRGB potentially set on them necessarily, right? Or they may have, but we're setting the flag here as if they weren't, et cetera, et cetera. And again, that's because we weren't getting a reliable answer from the AMD driver. It's supposed to support uh, that process for us. It's supposed to support multi-sample sRGB, but it simply wouldn't let us create one. We tried to create a surface uh, multiple times. We tried a lot of different ways and it never actually worked. Uh, so if we come back here and we take a look at what we're seeing here, this OpenGL default frame buffer texture format there, that's kind of a, um, a big old red flag there because I think that default frame buffer texture format is getting set to not be sRGB. Uh, and that's going to cause us a bunch of problems. So since it's set to not sRGB, that means the reads and writes won't actually go through the sRGB path, path on the frame buffer write, but they will come in that way on the read. Like we could have all kinds of problems there. So let's turn this off first, and then let's go ahead and do our blend. Um, let's let's just not do any of the uh, of the suggested stuff. We'll let it go, and let's just do our blend and see if the blend is working roughly correctly at that point. Right. All right. Um, so this is looking pretty good. It's not quite correct, uh, but it's looking close to correct. We have some issues to address, uh, but some things are looking really nice. Uh, and I think we just have a little bit more work to do in terms of uh, our representation. You can even see that those beautiful shadows are in there correctly in a lot of places, uh, which is kind of awesome. Uh, but we definitely have some places where we're getting uh, some kind of nonsensical results. And you can see those like with the little heads, uh, the way they're kind of disappearing in weird ways and, and all sorts of other things like that. So uh, we have some strange things there. Now, uh, some things this scheme would not quite work properly for. Uh, and one of the things that this scheme will not work properly for is too many things layered on top of each other that have alpha, right? Because we're only processing one layer of alpha right now. Uh, and for something like particle systems, that's not going to necessarily cut it. Uh, we probably don't want to do depth peeling any more than we're already doing it, though, uh, in terms of if we wanted to support particle systems, what we should probably do is just handle particle systems in a separate pass or something like this. So I'm not too worried about that because we can just split the particle systems off. What I'm more worried about is some things that I think should be working and aren't working. So what we really want to focus on now is a couple of those things. So for example, right here you can see uh, something that I think should probably be working that, but isn't, and that is this sort of halo uh, around the hero's head where we got kind of a bright region. And so what I think that bright region is, is again, I think that's a failure to be uh, doing the sRGB properly. So I want to kind of go through and clean up that sRGB-ness uh, and try to get that working uh, uh, like a little more cleanly. We also have some places where the shadows appear to be munged. And I think, I don't really know, but my suspicion is, yeah, that's, I think what that is, is just if two shadows overlap each other, the depth peeling scheme, again, won't really work. And the reason that that depth peeling scheme uh, won't work in that case is just because we end up in a situation where uh, we can't peel that many times, right? We've got too many things to peel. Now, one of the interesting things about doing the depth peeling is we're starting to put ourselves in a much more powerful situation in terms of making trade-offs, though, there, which means that even though that sounds like it wouldn't work with only two depth peels, I think we may be able to, instead of breaking our shadows into a separate pass or something like that, we may actually be able to do something cle more clever there. We may be able to do something fancy um, in like a saucy gentleman kind of a way uh, that will allow us to do something clever with multiple overlapping shadows such that even with only one depth peel, we may be able to get away with something there. So let's push forward a little bit. So what I want to do now is this is looking pretty good and I don't really think uh, I want that multi-sampling uh, to be happening anymore because it's looking like the depth peel is, is way better than the multi-sampling. Um, and even if we went to three depth peels, I think that might not be uh, too expensive if we had to uh, compared to multi-sample. I don't really know. It's hard to know how much the multi-sample costs. Uh, we haven't done a lot of profiling of it, so it's difficult to say. 
Uh, but what I would like to do here is I would like to go ahead and if zero this out temporarily. Uh, so where we do this test texture here, what I'd like to do is just say, you know what, um, forget it. Let's just assume that you got that. Uh, and uh, let's let's just go uh, with with the um, let's just go with the non uh, multi sampling for now. Uh, so let's see what happens if these get set to sRGB. I'm just curious what we're going to end up seeing here. Uh, and so lo and behold, it is exactly like I said. If we do have the sRGB enabled properly, so that now we have sRGB textures and an sRGB frame buffer, what you can see, and maybe this is a little bit too much to ask from the streaming. Uh, situation. So I guess when I say what you know, you can see. I guess what I mean is I can see um, the halo around the hero is now gone. So the sRGB is now working properly, which is exactly what I had hoped for. Uh, and so uh, that kind of takes care of that. And so now we're just down to a few remaining problems. Uh, there's a couple things here that that I'd I'd like to take a look at. Um, and, and again, I think I know what most of it is, but you know, we got to take a closer look and also see what we can do to fix it. Um, so what you can see here is there's a few weirdnesses. We're getting some fringing around the edges of the trees when they're not over something we drew. Uh, and I'm not 100% certain why that is, but I suspect this has to do with how the background colors uh, are summed together. And what I suspect is happening there is perhaps the clear color is not getting modulated properly uh, or something else is happening there. I'm not sure what's going on. Uh, but I do feel like that's probably a problem. So yeah, if in fact, if you think about what needs to happen now, uh, I think I can pretty much just guess what's happening there directly. I don't think I need to investigate it much further actually, because I think it's actually, it's, it seems almost straightforward. Uh, I think what's going on there is the, we've got two buffers and we're adding them together. When the alpha value in the top buffer is zero, we need the color to also be zero because we're treating it as a pre-multiplied alpha. And if we're treating it as a pre-multiplied alpha, what's very important to get correct there is that we can't have anywhere where there's color in the buffer that wasn't multiplied by its alpha value. The clear, unfortunately, will do exactly that. So that top buffer, that front buffer, actually needs to be cleared to zero not the background color, because it's supposed to be a pre-multiplied alpha target, right? So I think what we actually want to do here is in this target index thing, uh, what we want to do is say, well, only the final peel really wants to do that. Uh, so what we want to do here is say where we do this clear with the clear depth, clear color uh, situation, what we want to do is actually do this in sort of a, a, a predicated way uh, where we're going to actually clear to pure zero if it's the top one because we don't want it to have data anywhere uh, that it should show through to the bottom. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is just say if the target index is greater than zero, do the normal clear, uh, but otherwise don't, right? Uh, and so now hopefully I'm, I'm hoping the trees will show up properly at the top and uh, they do, so that's great news. In fact, if I rotate them here, you can see that that fringing is now gone. Um, and so that's really good. And so we're starting to look really nice here. Actually, everything's pretty smooth. And so we're just, you know, honestly, the only thing I really see now is the is when we've got multiple overlapping alpha, uh, you know, elements. That seems to be a problem. So I guess what I'd like to do here uh, is I'd like to figure out um, a way to maybe mitigate that problem. So what I'm going to sort of say is what if we were to say something like, instead of using the depth test on alpha things, maybe we force alpha things not to go uh, through the depth test on the peel, and we use their alpha values to make a judgment call about them or something, right? Um, basically what I'm saying is, if we were to draw uh, if we were to draw alpha to objects in a in a way that doesn't respect the depth buffer, you know, would that would that be sufficient? Um, so I want to think this out loud a little bit because I guess we actually have a number of different things we could do here, and I really don't know which one of them would be the most logical. Um, there's a really simple one we can do, um, but.
But there's a couple things. So first of all, one thing that I'm not really sure about is I'm not really sure about whether you can kill just the depth right. Uh, and that's, so, so, you know, I don't really know, uh, I don't know if you can do a predicated depth right. So I just, I'm, let me just talk this out with you so that you know where my head's at uh, and what I'm, so that what I'll do will make, will make sense. Um, so here we are on day 382. Um, and we need to deal with alpha uh, plus Z buffer. Because uh, that was actually looking pretty nice. And one of the interesting things about it too, I don't know if you can see it, uh, because, you know, again, there's some bugs in it uh, in the other way. But you'll notice that now when our, like those little head particles, for example, when those don't overlap, we now have the full range of alpha. And similarly, remember how banded our shadows used to look? Now our shadows are perfect. So basically, with the exception of the overlapping alpha case, we're really nailing it. With this depth feeling, it just produces a much better image. And again, we've done nothing in terms of sorting here. So we're just letting the GPU do all the dirty work. Um, and that's pretty great. So I really like this one depth feel solution. We could even consider going to more than one depth feel. Uh, but uh, what I want to do now is just think it through uh, what we might need to do. Because it seems like depth peel for, for uh, sprites is like perfect, right? It seems like it does everything correct. So the only problem is the depth peel for alpha is not quite good enough because when we have two things that go over each other. But for sprites where the alpha is just on the edges, it works great, right? So, we have a couple options here. Let's just talk about them a little bit. So, first of all, let me just say what the standard procedure is a lot of times when you're dealing with transparent objects. A lot of times people bin their transparent objects and draw their transparent objects in a separate pass. Uh, so, what happens is, you know, we could do something like that. Uh, and we have three passes. And we composite those passes. So, for example, pass zero here, right? Uh, is going to be our front pixels. Um, and there are the opaque pixels, right? So things that have, that the only alpha on them is actually going to be when they blend out to something. Um, you know, and then there's pass one, which is our back pixels that are opaque. Uh, and then pass two, uh, would be the transparent objects. Uh, and that way we would always basically like the transparent objects would just kind of mush together uh, into that buffer and we could try to do something clever there with how we blend them together. Maybe just always use additive blending for our translucent stuff, I don't know. Uh, but again, you know, just thinking about how this would work, we'd have problems here if we didn't want to sort these guys, which I don't. I want to let the Z buffer do it. Um, we'd have problems there where we have you know, again, those, if we want to do shadow sprite compositing, I feel like that's going to be a problem. We'd probably have to have two passes, one for additive, one for subtractive, or something like this, for when shadows overlap each other, and all these other sorts of things. So what I wonder is, if we're doing the peeling, and we end up in a situation where we're doing these passes, is there a way we could do something smarter? I'm just interested to know. Uh, could we do something smarter with the, with the depth? Um, uh, where, could, could we do something where we use the fact that we know something's alpha or not to do something smarter uh, when we're doing these passes, when we're doing the, the two depth peel passes, right? Because um, let's take the case of two shadows that overlap each other, for example, right? If we know we have multiple shadows that are overlapping each other, we really only need to take the darkest one. Right. So if we knew that the only thing that we ever had was shadows, all we'd have to do is go, well, if I've got a shadow, um, I could remember the fact that this is a shadow potentially, right? So write something into the depth buffer or the, the spare you know, uh, piece of the buffer that we weren't using, like say the alpha value, right? Because the, the destination alpha um, on pass one is not used. Like here we use the RGB and A of the front pixel right? This uses everything. 
But here we only care about the RGB. A is not really used, right? Um, and right now the only reason we're using alpha at all is because in that pass we just save the alpha so we can back it out later, but we could just back it out at the time we write it. There's no need to actually store it here. So we could, we have a, a fourth channel where we could store information that we're not using. And that information could be like a total shadow amount or who knows what, right? So we could do something there. Um, so if we, were, if we were just trying to render shadows, there's no question that we could do that relatively cleanly. But of course, if we were just rendering shadows, we could also just do them in a second pass, right? If we, if we already binned our shadows, we could do them here. So I don't know that that gets us out of anything. We could just do a shadow pass, basically, right? And that would be fine. But I don't know, uh, let's, once we broaden it out, uh, so we've got shadows uh, and we've got fading, right, is basically the two things that we've got at the moment. So we've got things that, that want to darken what's underneath them and we've got things that want to fade out. So they are there, but they're fading out, right? Um, So it makes me wonder, it makes me wonder if we were to just do a three pass solution where we do pass zero, pass one as we're doing now, and we basically force anything that uh, isn't part of an opaque object. So, you know, anything that's got an alpha value on the object. I'm trying to think if that would be sufficient. I mean, the other thing we could do is just say the heck with it and do a bunch of death peels, right? Just really force the GPU to do, to go crazy and basically do effectively end death peels, which is kind of like doing the atomics version where we just do four death peels and say, the heck with it. I don't know. I do not know. What I do know is I should have crossed my Z to distinguish it from a two. So I'm really not sure what to do here. I really don't know. I would like a better idea of what I should do here. And I'm just not sure what the, what the cleanest approach is. Because I don't know yet, I'm curious to just see if we can set this up to set an arbitrary number of depth fields. Right, um, so I'm wondering what would happen if I did that. So let's say that we wanted to do, you know, more depth fields than the amount that we're currently doing, uh, you know. And so if we were going to do more depth fields, I guess one thing that's kind of a little bit interesting is, <clears throat> I wonder if we don't, if we really don't have to do it quite the way I was doing it. Because one of the things with depth peels is we need two separate, um, we need two separate depth buffers, but do we really need two separate frame buffers? Because I don't think we actually do. I think we can just keep accumulating into a separate frame buffer going from front to back. And that would allow us to not have to do a final composite at all, right? Um, to be clearer about what I'm talking about, uh, if we were to draw the first frame, uh, the first peel, we know that's the front pixel, right? 
If we simply drew onto the same frame buffer again, if we just draw onto this frame buffer again, using the, the depth peel technique, so we have a separate depth buffer, but if we just drew it on again, I feel like we could just use destination alpha blending to do the blend at that point. All we do is use the destination's alpha value to do one minus whatever the value we're writing in and write to the frame buffer using a standard blend mode, right? Using standard blending. And I feel like that would allow us to just accumulate depth peels as many times as we want. And furthermore, we could actually make that be parameterized on the frame rate. So as the frame rate degrades, we'd, you know, on slower machines, we'd draw fewer times and you'd have more artifacts. But as if you were on a higher end machine, it would do more depth passes and improve the quality. Does that make sense? Again, I don't really know if this is a technique that anyone uses, but it's just kind of interesting. Um, I feel like it's, it's interesting. I, I kind of like it. I kind of just want to go with it. Um, so let's imagine that we were going to do that. Uh, and let's imagine, so, so let's pretend that that's basically just how the renderer worked, is we just keep accumulating. And we draw as many times as we feel like we can based on the quality of the machine that we're running on. So maybe we support like, you know, eight separate depth peels, right? So it's basically doing the same number of fills as the multi-sample one was. Um, but now with perfect, perfect alpha compositing, you know, on a fast card, we could just go ahead and do that. On a card that was really slow, maybe we only do two or three depth peels. Um, and, you know, occasionally you see some artifacts when you have lots of things on top of each other or something like this. Um, it's just an interesting idea. I just kind of like it. And so I'm going to try it. Uh, I don't have anything else to say about it other than that, that I find it interesting and I like experimenting with things that I find interesting. Um, so maybe what I'll do is I'll just say that this max render target index um, is, is just always kind of going to be two at this point. Because really what we're talking about here is we're just going to have like a ping pong buffer scenario. Um, and so when we do, when we create these, we're actually not going to create a separate frame buffer every time. We're just going to create uh, the frame. The, we're just going to create one image frame buffer, and the only thing that we're really going to be doing, having more of, uh, is the uh, is the depth buffer. So we're going to have two depth buffers, but we're only going to have one uh, image buffer, if that makes sense. So let's see what happens if we do that. So what I'm going to do here is say, OK, uh, we're going to take the, um, the image buffer here, which is this part, this, this bit right here. And I'm just going to say, instead of calling GL text image 2 d I'm going to skip this part of it, um, this bind texture text handle 0 uh, gen textures thing. I'm just going to skip this part of creating this image um, and I'm always, well, you know what, I'll even leave that in for now, uh, because I guess I don't have to get rid of the creation of it. We can get rid of the creation later when I verify this is the technique I want to use. What I'm going to do is when we call GL frame buffer text 2D, rather than using the texture handle zero that we actually created for this frame buffer, I'm actually going to use the global frame buffer texture handle for slot zero always. So we're always drawing to the same color buffer we're not always drawing to the same depth buffer, right? That's basically all we're talking about here. So this way we can kind of swap which one we're drawing to based on which depth buffer we want to use, but we're not going to change which color buffer we write to. So we write the first one in, and then we have that buffer. We switch to the other one so that we can read from the, the texture buffer uh, and then we can keep ping-ponging back and forth. Uh, and I think that would just work. Uh, all right, so then the other thing that I want to do is just change this shader then uh, to skip the read and just to, uh, just all it's going to do is just bring uh, just that one basic texture to the front. So this stuff now would go away, basically, um, and all we're going to do 
is we're going to say, hey, uh, let's take the, the fragment color from just one of the buffers, right? So skip all that stuff and just say uh, result color equals peel zero. That's all we're going to do, right? All right. Um, so now what we need to do is we, since, since we're only going to see frame buffer one, we need to now turn on blending and actually make what I just said uh, a reality. Uh, so what we need to do here is we need to re-enable blending because we need to actually, uh, you know, operate uh, on the, the frame buffer. And so what we need to do is set the GL blend func, uh, and we need to set it now to something a little more sensible than this, right? So the first time through, uh, we want to just write it uh, something like this, basically. Uh, so we're not, we have blending on, but the function actually doesn't do any blending. Uh, and in fact, I guess what we could do is actually disable the blend entirely uh, and set the other blend function correctly. I don't know how we want to do this. Uh, it's tough to say. But anyway, we could disable the blend here um, and then later switch it back on. And so to switch it back on, what I'm going to do here is say, okay, uh, let's go to... Um, here. Uh, so when we end the peels, right, so we do the begin peels and end peels, uh, when we jump back to uh, do this peel count here, what I want to do is if it's the first peel and we're going through, right, then we do want to do no blending. When it's the second peel that we're coming through, uh, we want to enable blending and we want to set the blend function to be something that's going to take the background, the pixels that are behind the ones, and blend them in with the destination alpha. Uh, so what we want to do there is say, well, uh, we want one minus destination alpha for whatever's currently um, coming in. So the background pixel is going to take, it's going to take the frame buffer, which is now the foreground pixel, right? It's thing that's in front of us. We're going to mo modulate ourselves by that destination alpha. And then we're going to just take whatever's in the front buffer is just already pre-multiplied. So that we can just take, right, and draw. Uh, so that should composite on top in theory. Uh, and then what we have to do is when we are, so when we're, oh, I put that in the wrong place. Uh, this is actually the first time it comes through. It hits end peel, so now it needs to switch to the mode for the second peel, right? Uh, so here we go. Um, so now what I'm expecting is something kind of similar to what we had before. It's not quite right here, so I didn't, I didn't quite do it correctly, um, but you're getting closer. So if we enable blend and we have one minus test alpha GL one here. Uh, I'm going to have to figure out why we're not quite getting what I expect there. Um, and we are drawing with no blending here, correct? Uh, so that in theory should be filling the destination alpha channel and we are clearing the destination alpha to zero as well uh, so that should be correct um, as far as I know seems right to me uh, but we're definitely not getting what I would have expected so what I would have expected here is is basically the same thing we had before What's a little weird about it is we are getting sort of that in a couple places. So it's a little weird because we're getting sort of that and sort of not, which is a little confusing because um, I would have expected it to be more wrong than that. Uh, but at the moment, yeah, at the moment, I'm definitely seeing some things that are like those artifacts weren't there in the other pass, and we should be able to get literally exactly the same thing. Uh, that we got in the other pass. And so I want to just figure out what I messed up there because I definitely messed up something. Um, so let's see here. Uh, well, I guess one thing, so here's one problem. We don't want to clear the other buffer anymore uh, because we only have one color buffer now. 
So we only want to set up, we only want to do the clear um, at all. Like this, this clear needs to not happen, right? Um, so we only want to clear the depth buffer on any buffers after the first buffer. We don't want to clear the color buffer uh, because that's just erroneous, right? Now that didn't help us at all, um, but you know that, that was one of the artifacts we fixed before, so we have to keep that in place. So let's see now. So when we are doing those, that seems like it would be reasonable. We're drawing to the first frame buffer first, um, and we are drawing with uh, blend disabled, which is what I would expect. When we hit the first set of peels, we're not blending, so we should fill the buffer up with colors. Um, I guess one thing I can try here is just disable everything in the second pass. So what I can do is I can just say, hey, you know what? Let's take a GL blend func um, of zero one, so it doesn't change what's in the destination, and uh, that should give me a little bit of a better uh, view of what got written first, right? So that to me looks like exactly what I wanted to see in that first frame buffer. Uh, so I don't see anything particularly odd there to be concerned about. So it looks like it's the second pass that's really doing the weird stuff, whatever that weird stuff is. So I'm gonna go ahead and now do the opposite of what I just did. Um, I'm gonna set it so that now I only see uh, the second pass. So this will only draw what's in the second pass. I won't see uh, anything uh, that was in the, the first pass. Um, and so looking at these, uh, honestly, again, um, that that looks correct ah i know why i can't do this uh so because i only want to render once the blend i only want to render the closest thing in right um so that I can't just render everything because the Z buffer is still doing the sort. And I only want to blend the one that actually passes the, the frontmost pass, right? So I really don't have the ability uh, to do exactly what I wanted to do, uh, which is to just sum into a single color buffer. I need two color buffers. Um, I, so I do need to do the depth peel the same way that I was doing it, basically, um, always. Uh, so if I want to do successive summations, I need to smack down the color buffers so that they can be added together in that way. So I don't think there's any way to do an incremental version like that. Um, at the very least, I would have to do, every time I did a depth peel, I could smack it down into the existing depth peel, but uh, into the existing like summation, but I do have to use one extra color buffer all the time, right? Um, I don't have the, op the option of sort of doing the, I don't have the ability to do uh, the sort of cheesy, um, always sum into one buffer thing, because I need to let the Z buffer do the sort every time. Yeah, so unfortunately that means I can't quite go infinite like I was thinking before without having a smackdown, you know, a thing that actually smushes down to, uh, takes two color buffers and merges them at the end of every peel. That's not the end of the world, but it is more expensive, right? Um, so I'm trying to think of how I want to do this. It's obviously more efficient to just do it in one. So I think what I might do then is I think what I might do is say, let's suppose we want to do th uh, four depth peels or something, right? 
So I set max render target index to three and I generate that many of these buffers. It's more buffers than we actually need, um, but I'm just gonna try it for now. They get cleared out. Uh, so what I wanna do here is I wanna say if render target index um, equals max render target index, then we're at the last one and that's when we clear it. All the rest of them get cleared to zero, I think is how we want it, right? Uh, then what I do here is I'd say, well, okay, uh, we always want to bind the peel count buffer, uh, whichever buffer that is, um, when we come through here. And we always want to pull uh, when, we, when we are doing that depth test, uh, we always want to pull from whatever the previous round's depth buffer was. Uh, so in here where we're doing peeling, oh, so we're already, and we're already doing that. So that would produce a number of, of those uh, buffers. And what we could do here is we could do a for i loop, right? Um, where we set the active texture. Um, so we could say, oh, uh, you know, peel index, max render target index. Uh, and we just set it this way. Uh, so that like sets up all of the peels properly um, and we could wind down the peels in the same way. Uh, so we'd just say like, okay, you know, nuke the peels the same way. I don't really know if I need to do that or not. I never sure in OpenGL what state needs to get unset, um, but you, you know, uh, you get the idea. Um, so we could do something like this and that would give us, you know, as many of those as we wanted, right? We could, we could just do as many as we wanted. Um, but the only downside there is that we do then need to go like, okay, we need a bunch of different samplers here, right? We need all of these uh, additional samplers to get those additional depth fields, right? So then we end up having to do, uh, you know, multiple peels there. Uh, and I think in this case, if we always are just doing the summation, um, everything is modulated by its alpha. So I feel like only the final peel uh, needs to actually be the one that gets the, the fix up for the alpha, um, I believe, right? Uh, so, oops. Uh, so we've got a modulator on there. We don't care about that so much. Uh, so we're adding peel, uh, we're adding each of these peels together because those are all, they, they should all be, well, no. So each one of them is pre-modulated by its own alpha, but it's not modulated by anyone else's alpha. So we need to add them together uh, in sort of a like, you know, progressive fashion here. So we need to do is say, well, peel zero is the color that it should be. Uh, so we need to modulate what's underneath it by one minus peel alpha, right? So everything that's underneath peel zero gets modulated by peel zero's alpha. Now everything that's under it also happens to be like peel one, right, RGB which now also has to modulate everyone else by the inverse of its alpha, right? So one minus peel one's alpha, and you can see how this kind of goes, right? Um, so maybe what we wanna do here is kind of build it up from the bottom uh, to make it a little cleaner to read. Uh, so what we would wanna do is say, all right, we know that peel three, we've already adjusted the RGB of it to be correct. So we know that our result color can start out being equal to PL3, which is the bottom most of the layers that we're processing. So then next what we do is we lever up one, we say PL2 RGB, we'll add that in, and we'll take whatever the thing is that we had previously uh, gathered, and we'll modulate that, right? Then we'll do that again, uh, and then we'll do that one more time. And so in that way, we sort of like take the bottom one, composite it, composite it, composite it, as if we're basically doing the blending ourselves here, right? 
so now, of course, we got to debug this nonsense that I just made. Uh, but hopefully that won't be too hard. All right. Uh, so let's just assume that this is pretty reasonable here. So we start with PL3's colors. Uh, we got to, like, in case we do want to turn back on uh, this stuff, let's go ahead and uh, make sure that's correct. OK. Um, so we sample these. Uh, peels out here. We're good to go. Um, I guess one of the things is we've got to make sure uh, that all of these are correct. Uh, and what I want to do here is I just want to I just want to go ahead and say like maybe these things we're going to be a little bit more careful about now. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, get rid of these parts we don't use, like so. Um, and I'm going to put in here this as maybe an array. Uh, so in the OpenGL program, <clears throat> Uh, I'm going to call this, uh, oh, well, you know what? We still need the depth sampler for the other one. Uh, and what I'm going to do here is I'm going to have a peel sampler and make four of those. Now, we could actually use an arrayed property for these, actually, um, but I'm not going to do that at the moment. All right. uh, okay, so we're going to put these down here because uh, they're kind of special at this point. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make it so that uh, we kind of need, what I want to do at this point is I want some way of setting these locations in a more useful fashion. Because like right now, we don't really have the ability to do something sensible uh, with the OpenGL program in terms of doing those settings, right? And so what you'll notice is we kind of have two different types of settings here. Uh, if we go, uh, if if we go, kind of look at at how this is is working, you can see what happens in use be, uh, program begin. You can see that we've got you know like a couple of different things that we set here, right? Um, and then we've got these also these vertex attrib pointers, which are sort of a separate thing. Now the vertex attributes we don't really change much, nor do we change the program handle much, so those can kind of stay. Uh, but if you look at what's happening here, we kind of have two different programs, right? Um, we've got the OpenGL, uh, or, or we've got uh, the, the uh, what's the word for it? ZBIAS program, you know, and then we've got the peel, pro, uh, peel composite program. And they really now are completely divergent, right? Like this wants those, and this wants this. Right. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to have some way, ideally, if we were going to do a lot of these, we'd probably want some abstraction for this uh, where we can kind of say, here's what each one takes. But in this case, since they're so divergent, I don't know that I really care about that. So I'll probably just make two different uh, versions of the use program thing. Right. Um, it doesn't seem like it really makes much sense to do anything fancier than that uh, at the moment. At least I can't think of a reason why we would. If we have lots and lots of shaders, you'd want to figure out some way of cleaning that up so that you didn't have to constantly be fussing with it. Um, but I don't really see that being a particularly useful thing to do at the moment because we really just don't have enough um, stuff to make that be necessary, right? Um, so even in this case, I think I may just do it like this. Uh, well, you know what? Here, we'll do it like this. Or maybe like that. So since we've got some shared stuff here, let's just target the shared stuff and make that easier. Uh, and then in here, we'll actually call these what they are. Z bias program, 
Zubias program, uh, peel composite program, right? And so now what I want to do is say, all right, when we do use program begin and use program end, um, then in this uh, in this sort of model, they're going to pass the the common part. Uh, and then in here we just have use program begin, use program end um, for basically like the other everyone else, right? Um, so we say, okay, we've got the ZBIOS program. And you know what? Use program end is the same for everybody, so I guess that one doesn't really matter. So we really just have a different use program begin. And we've got two different use program begins. We've got one for the ZBIOS program. Uh, and one for the uh, peel composite program. Uh, and both of them want to do use program begin for the common section. Uh, and one of the nice things here is render setup doesn't need to happen for the common section. Um, so actually, I think that doesn't get a pass through. Only this one gets a pass through, and now we can eliminate that dead version of the setup that, that was happening before, which is kind of nice too. Uh, so then what we can do is say, all right, uh, we know that we, we know exactly what we're doing here. Uh, we can just say, uh, you know, peel sampler. In fact, we can just do it this way. So this way, no matter what we set that to, that's how many, you know, peels it'll do, uh, and uh, you know, or we could parameterize it with something else later if we want it to be variable, like I was talking about before. Uh, and then in the case of the ZBIOS program, now we've got all this other nonsense that gets set in that one, and it can kind of come down here uh, into a place where it makes more sense, right? So now that's looking much nicer, right? Much, much nicer. Uh, and I don't think we really have to change much uh, in the rest of the code. We now can get rid of the dead code here of the setup that we were passing as a dummy variable uh, because now that won't happen, which is nice. Uh, and um, yeah, let's go ahead and get rid of that. Uh, and so now what we need to do is just, this is a ZBIOS program, not a regular program. So that's fine. And uh, these are always just going to be on common. Right? Uh, so that's all good. There we go. Uh, and now what we want to do is, is these folks want to write uh, directly into their special kind of programs that's for whatever they, they do. Uh, and so, you know, a couple of these will be uh, common, going into the common section, uh, such as that, uh, the handle and the, uh, the vertex IDs, like these, like so. Uh, and so that we could also pull out, right? We could make that be something that's shared between them. I'm not going to do that just yet because uh, it seems like kind of a waste of effort a little bit. But, you know, we do this one more time and, and it probably would uh, start to make some sense. You know? All right. Uh, so peel composite program. Like, there we go. Uh, and so now we've got a bunch of debugging work to do to get this to work properly. Um, you can see we're, we're still drawing okay for uh, the front buffer, but our, our peel composite is not doing anything right, uh, which is fine, right? We, we kind of hacked that stuff in there, and we need to be a little more careful about what we're doing. Uh, so let's go ahead and, and check. First of all, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and, and re-enable re this path here. I want to look at what each of the paths looks like. Um, so here's peel zero, right? That's the... That's the first peel there. Um, let's look at peel one. Uh, again, that looks pretty reasonable. Nothing super out of the ordinary. Here's peel two. 
Not great. Not great. So what's going on with our PL2 here? Oh, right. Uh, we're not drawing anything to those yet. So this has to be um, a little bit a little bit more sensible. Uh, so peel count, I'm going to change to peel index um, at the moment. So let's go ahead and let's let's fix that here uh, to be peel index. And so when this goes through and does peel index here, uh, what I want to do now is I, I want this to be able to go higher. So effectively, this will just keep looping um, when we do open, when we hit the end. We're going to keep looking, looping until uh, the peel index reaches the final, you know, the final render target. So the first time through, it'll be at 0. Second time through, it'll be at 1. Next time through, it'll be at 2. Next time through, it'll be a 3. And that'll be the end, and it'll flip to uh, the last one. I think we want to wait till one after that, if I'm not mistaken, because we want to draw to each buffer. So we actually want to do the loop each time through. Uh, so we want to do, like, if it's less than or equal to the max render target, do this, right? And then as soon as it exceeds that, uh, then we will assert that the, we're at that last one. Um, No, 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 I'm incorrect. Because when we come through here, we actually increment it. It's on the end. So we want to wait till we get to that last one. And we've done the last one. Then we are actually done. And we flip back to 0. OK. So let's see what PL2 looks like now. There's PL2. Um, again, it's even further drilling backwards. Uh, and let's finally take a look at now at the last PL, uh, which is PL3. Uh, so there's PL3, and you can see it gets really pretty far back. Uh, and so that's good news because, again, like, you know, if, only, if it only takes four depth peels to do a good composite, yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, okay, so we've got four v valid peels. Uh, what we don't have is a compositor that works at all. Our compositor is complete garbage right now. We can tell that because all we see is a black screen. And that's not a very compelling composite. If we were to ship a game that just consisted of a black screen with a frame rate counter, uh, while certain streamers would be very happy to see that it hits 60 frames a second, perhaps, uh, they would not be very happy with the fact that it was an entirely black screen. Uh, you may um, not be surprised to hear as well that it's not that hard to hit 60 frames a second with a black screen. Not that I'm certain that some people couldn't quite do it. So, for, for example, I'm quite certain that a number um, of uh, game you see these days could could manage to somehow still not hit 60 frames a second with a black screen but you know it's what are you gonna do um let's go ahead and take a look at what we messed up here so uh i'm interested to know what's going on it, it would appear and I, I guess i don't know for sure uh but it would appear that something is a bit suspicious because i don't really understand um When I run this, I'm, I'm just a little perplexed because I'm looking at it here and I see the, the, this is, it's not a completely black screen. The frame rate counter is there. So everything that's drawn at the end is working. Um, and if I look at the peel zero, I see that frame rate counter on peel zero, which is exactly where I would have expected it. It's not there on PL1, uh, right? It's not there on PL2. Yeah. Uh, and it's not there on PL3. So what's interesting to me is how we're ending up with black pixels uh, when somehow the frame rate counter still shows through properly, and that's on PL0. So if we were just copying PL0 in, I would have expected to see uh, everything on PL0, not just the frame rate counter. That's not what I'm seeing, so it's a bit odd to me. Um, so this ought to be interesting. Uh, let's jump back here a second. I just want to make sure we are still creating all those textures. Uh, we are, so that's good. Just want to make sure. Uh, of what was happening there. So let's let's 
hop down uh, to compose, uh, compile, uh, peel composite, and take a look at what I did for the code here, because I probably made some stupid mistakes here. Uh, if we're lucky, they won't be too hard to spot. Um, so let's take a look at what we're doing. Here's our result color. And our result color just is a successive, uh, it's a series of successive blends uh, with its, uh, you know, the, the underlying peel layers. Uh, pretty, pretty much right off the bat, what I'm going to do is the same sort of debugging I was doing before. I'm going to start by just looking at the different peels to see whether or not I'm getting them, right? So here's me trying to copy just peel zero straight across. Uh, and I want to see what I'm getting. So what's interesting about this is if I copy peel zero straight across, I see effectively just nothing on the screen, which is not at all what I would have expected, right? So it's a little bit weird. I don't really understand uh, what I'm seeing. Now, I want to take a look at what the alpha value is because I don't know if blending is still on. Uh, but let me just set the alpha value to 1 because I really don't know what's going on there. Um, Right? Again, like I, I just really don't know. Uh, so let me take a look at peel 1. So it, everything is basically black. Uh, all of our peels that we were just viewing, uh, we're not actually getting them, but we are getting the frame rate counter, which is mystifying at best. Uh, all of the peels are black except for the frame rate counter. Uh, appears to be basically what we're looking at, right? Um, okay, so how are we getting that? How is that happening, right? What are we seeing here? I have no idea whatsoever. Um, because taking this stuff out of the equation, uh, yeah, I don't know uh, what's going on. Now, what I could do too is I could if zero this stuff out in case maybe there's some kind of a NAN situation going on. But even that I don't think should have affected it. Uh, I don't anticipate that being a problem. I'm now going to go ahead and just take it one step further. I'm going to force the color to red to verify that I'm even seeing what I think I'm seeing in this case. Um, so that's good. So we are actually filling the screen with what the results are here. It's just somehow when we are sampling these actual texture peels, we're, we're really getting something that somehow only drew... Uh, I mean, it boggles the mind. I, it's obviously something that when I see it, I'll be like, oh, duh. But I really don't know uh, where it's coming from because I don't understand how I'm seeing that frame rate counter pl you know, plain as day uh, when if I draw the frame buffers themselves, I I'm seeing all the actual additional data in there, right? It's a bit strange. Uh, so the question is, how are we, yeah, how, how is that happening? What's going on there? So you can see me binding the textures here. Uh, I'm going through each of the peels and I'm binding the textures uh, to the successive texture units uh, by using global frame buffer textures with the peel index, which I believe is, again, correct. I don't think there's anything unusual about that. Uh, and I am kind of, I think, seeing those happen properly. I'm going to take a look at the use program begin uh, just to see if there's anything weird going on there. Uh, that's setting things up exactly the way I would have expected. And again, it's, it's just setting... Uh, the various peel uh, samplers to to be what they are, right? There's nothing, again, uh, nothing weird going on there. Uh, we can verify, we can certainly verify that. Um, but yeah, I don't know. So coming through here, we also expect blending to be disabled at this time. Uh, I'll double check that it's disabled. So I'm going to go ahead and disable the blend, but uh, I don't see what that would have to do with anything. And again, it doesn't have anything. Uh, it doesn't do anything, which is what I would have expected. Uh, when we bind frame buffer zero, we should be writing clear of anything. Uh, we shouldn't be having any uh, weirdness there, as far as I can imagine. So this is a real, a real bizarre one. Uh, I cannot, could not say really what's going on there. Um, if we saw nothing, I would have some theories. The fact that I see something makes it pretty strange. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and regress now. Again, I'm just kind of. Um, Grasping at straws here. I have no idea uh, what's going on. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to go ahead and gather up uh, just that, just the very first texture. Uh, it didn't quite. It didn't tell me what failed. Uh, oh, uh, but I know what failed. Uh, 
those all need to be defined, obviously. You can't just start talking about variables that don't exist yet. Uh, so here is one that literally only samples from the peel zero sampler at that frag UV, and then it goes ahead and it draws it right uh, with this. So what's interesting about this to me, um, what's interesting about this to me is I'm wondering if this is just a problem with wraparound effectively. Uh, so what I'm interested what I'm interested to know here is, so if I turn on uh, that frame buffer blit, and I look at what the frame buffers are via that path, right? What we know is that if I go via that path, I see a correct image. Uh, this is what I expect to be in PL0. The fact that I don't get anything when I come through this path suggests to me that maybe I'm setting some state that is not getting properly unset later, right? Um, so basically what I'm wondering is, let's suppose that I was to do this first, right? So I'm just gonna do this first. And then I'm still gonna do the blit at the end. I want to know what I see now if I look at peels here. Okay. So what we're seeing, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a flash at the beginning of the correct stuff, and then it turns to incorrect stuff. Uh, and so what I think is happening is the first frame is working properly, but we're leaving some state set that wraps around to the next run of the program uh, that then causes us to fail the next time through. So I think we're just leaving something set that we can't leave set. Um, and so that's, I think, all we're really chasing here. Um, so let's see if we can figure out what's going on uh, with that, with, with regards to that. So uh, the, uh, another question might be, uh, are we doing these clears correctly every time? Uh, I think we are. So I, I, that doesn't look particularly suspicious. Uh, so let's, let's talk about this here for a little bit. Let's see what's going on. Uh, we bind our frame buffers in here. Uh, we're doing our use program uh, begin, use program end correctly there. We're setting our active textures. So I'm wondering if maybe it's just, uh, you know what I think it is? I think it's we're not setting the active texture again. Uh, so I think what's happening is here, uh, right, this active texture, we're, we used to go backwards, so it would set the active texture to, to zero at the end. We now aren't doing that, so I bet that was the only problem. It's that active texture is not getting set. Yeah, so there we go. Uh, so that was the only problem with that. That That's a typical problem in OpenGL because it's got so much state. You know, you set something wrong and it carries over the next frame and suddenly you get these weird uh, bugs you weren't expecting. Uh, so that's okay, par for the course. Uh, no, real, no real piggy there. So let's go ahead and allow our reads to continue now and we'll enable this slowly one step at a time um, to try and get back now to uh, the, the composite pass and see what happens. So here we're going to run again. Uh, we're still seeing uh, only buffer zero, but that's good because we're reading from all of them. Doesn't seem like there's any big problems happening there. Uh, I'm going to turn off the like sort of overwrite at the end. Uh, and here we go. Let's go ahead and run that. Uh, so now in theory, we are actually compositing. Uh, we don't know if we're compositing properly, but we are at least trying to composite. Uh, and what we're seeing here is it doesn't look particularly good um, for us. Like, uh, it looks like we're really only getting two levels of, it basically looks the same as when we only composited twice. So I think I've, I'm not really uh, doing the other alpha composites properly, uh, possibly because I'm not doing the pre-multiplied alpha correctly, but I'm not sure. So we need to take a little bit closer look at that. Uh, we also then need to straighten out our shader simtex read sRGB. Uh, let me go ahead and take a look, by the way, at that uh, shader simtex read sRGB. Uh, that should be getting set correctly now, I believe. So I think we can re-enable this as well. Let's just double check. Yeah. Um, so now I, I think we're doing everything ex except for actually respecting those peel composites. They're not working properly, and I am not sure why. I think I've got this set up properly, but I could be very wrong about that. Um, but 
uh, just to walk you through it again, if you imagine what's happening here, I'm saying whatever the third peel is, we start with that color. We then blend two on top of that. So we, we take whatever the value was of two, we modulate away um, whatever the value of three was there uh, by the inverse of that alpha of whatever uh, peel two was. We then take peel one and we do the same thing. We put that on top of whatever the combination, the resulting combination uh, of the previous two was. And then finally, again, we, at, the, at the very end, uh, we just go ahead and do that one more time for peel zero. Uh, and I feel like that should be doing the compositing properly, but I don't really know. So let's make sure we're creating the peels the way that I think we should be, uh, because if the alpha values are incorrect, that would certainly uh, do it, right? So let's see what we're doing here. If we are doing depth peeling, uh, we, we bind whatever the previous depth texture was, obviously, and that's fine, uh, and that's what we would expect. When we do the Z-bias depth peel here, uh, program that is using a different program. We could check uh, to see whether that program is correct. We need to see uh, blending should always be off. So geo blend should always be off, I think. Um, and uh, it does look like it is, so that's fine. Um, Uh, and it's disabled entirely anyway, so it doesn't even matter what the alpha function, uh, what the blend function actually is. So let's take a look at the peeling program. I don't know if maybe there was something in there that could have been wrong. Uh, obviously, we discard. The discard looks like it was doing the right thing. Uh, the alpha values. Uh, get passed through without the fog, but. But that seems fine. I mean, that looks pretty reasonable. That looks like it should be writing out fair alpha values. Uh, and so I'm not really sure. Um, so, you know, there is one more problem that we have here that I'm not sure exactly how we would mitigate it. So there is one more problem we have. And this could be the problem that we're actually seeing, in fact, now that I think about it. So the other problem that we have, and this one's a little trickier, is when we are depth peeling, we don't really handle the case where two things are at exactly the same depth and just right on top of each other, right? Um, and in this case, the only places that we're really seeing errors right now are exactly those cases, right? That is exactly what we're seeing. Like basically everywhere our shadows are actually correct except where the Z values are identical, I think. Um, don't quote me on that, but I think that's exactly what we're seeing. So in that case, the depth peeling isn't smart enough to figure out what to do, right? Because if everything's at the same Z value, you would have that problem. Um, so let's just see, I'm just curious for sake of argument, Let's suppose that we went into the particle systems, for example, where we do see errors currently where those things overlap. Um, and if we were to say, well, OK, what if we jittered the Z values of those things so that they weren't exactly at the exact same Z? Uh, so when we do this push bitmap call, for example, uh, here, we're passing this P value down. Um, the P value that we're using uh, yeah, is it's always only operating in X and Y. It never changes the Z, right? So when things are spawned, uh, the Z value is always set uh, to zero, right? You can see it here. Uh, it's never set to anything else. So if we were just to set the Z value randomly instead, like so, 
would we get uh, more correct behavior with our particles? Um, that's what I'm interested in seeing, right? Uh, and it's hard to say. It still looks like they have the similar problem. I don't know if that's enough separation. Uh, let's just try it with something really absurd. Well, so I don't know. That still looks kind of wrong. So I'm wondering if we really, if we've just got a bug that's separate from that. Because it does kind of look like when they, it looks like whenever they pass through each other, you still get that bug. Um, and I don't know, I don't think that's the Z because I'm now setting the Z randomly, right? Or at least I tried to. Maybe that's not getting used, I don't know. But I think it is because it's just setting, it's just using the particle Z. Uh, and so I feel like it's kind of correct there. Like I feel like that's going to use that Z value. It's not a fair test because, I mean, it's, it's possible that that's not really moving the Z values like I would have wanted it to do. Um, So I think we may need a more controlled test case for this. Uh, because I think it's going to be too hard to guess what's going on here without a little bit more context. Uh, it does seem like, you know, I feel like we definitely would have a bug. Uh, in, the, in the shadow case, where the Z values would be basically the same. So I do feel like that might be part of what we're seeing in some cases. Uh, but it, it feels to me like we're getting bugs in places where the Z value isn't necessarily the same. And so that feels like not really what should be happening. Um, I also feel like now that, our, that we're using correct, like we're actually using correct Z, our particle spawn should be fixed to, you know, instead of spawning up in Y, which is what they were doing before, they should spawn up in Z, right? Because that was what was supposed to be happening. And we were only using Y because we didn't really have real Z. So now that we have real Z, I feel like our particles should be spawning upward. So there they are, right? Um, so that's better, right? Um, uh, and so since we kind of want a little bit of jitter there, I feel like we probably want to give it Something more like this. Don't know why I'm tuning this right now. Obviously, it's just, you know, sometimes it's hard to. Uh, wait, why did we, why is it this doing seven times that? What the, why wouldn't you just do, why wouldn't you just make that be seven? I don't know what the deal is with that. But anyway, we're going to fix that as well. So that's more correct, right? That's like what the what it should actually be doing there. Um, I feel like they want a lot more poof to that. They want a lot. They kind of want to. Uh, 
I mean, if we're honest. Now, granted, they should really not be spawning a bunch of heads. Um, you know, that's true. But if you imagine them spawning something reasonable. I like how they fall down to the, gra to the floor below. I wonder if we went downstairs, if we would just have stuff falling through the floor that we would then see, like, just coming at us, like, from above. I don't know if it makes it down here. Doesn't look like it does. Oh, yeah, there's some over in the corner. <laughs> Pretty soon, I'm going to have to actually write some code to let this guy move around for real. It's getting to be kind of a world that you want to actually explore and build some stuff in. I hate to say it. I hate to say it. But it's kind of true. Um, so, yeah... So I think we just aren't doing the compositing math correctly. I think I think that's mostly our problem here. Um, and you can see when this guy jumps behind the hero, which I don't um, I don't know if you can see this, but you get fringing on him. So it kind of feels like we're still only getting one depth peel instead of four. Uh, And I don't think that the Z values being equal can necessarily account for that. Now, maybe it can. Um, like, maybe all of those bugs are just because the Z values are, are the same. But I don't know if that's really plausible. Uh, you know, it, it seems probably a little bit not that plausible. Um, so I want to see here, let's suppose that I stopped blending in any of these other colors here. So that does not fill me with confidence because the back peel should have something in it. And I'm not seeing anything. So, okay, let's turn off the invert, the, the back alpha, you know, computation. So I'm seeing nothing for PL3, right? I'm seeing, I'm seeing literally nothing. If I just write PL3, I see nothing. That is not good. What about PL2? I see nothing for PL2. So, for some reason, I'm not imagining things when I say that, that it's like we only have two peels. Because we only seem to have two peels. Um, which ain't great. So, let's see here. We create some number of render targets. Uh, and those render targets are supposed to all be roughly equivalent. We then go through and clear all of them to zero except for the very last one, uh, which again I, I think is correct. But we're not, we must not be doing something right because, you know, if we should at least see that clear color come through, right? I mean, it's real weird. Uh, so, yeah, when we're coming through here, anytime the peel index 0, 1, 2, it should come through here, do the loop, draw in there, uh, and set peeling equal true. Uh, and so when we're doing the rest of this stuff, in theory, that should draw, right? I mean, I, th I think that, you know, that should be what's going on. I don't know, maybe that's not what's going on. Um, uh, 
I feel like GL Active Texture should always be getting set correctly now because we restore it at the end like we should. So that seems okay. I don't see why we would be having a problem with that. Uh, I would like to know what happens if I just blit them directly. Uh, so there's peel zero. Let's try peel three. That's just just straight up weird. So if I look at the peels here, I am getting them. So it's like I'm not able to read from those textures. I wonder if that has something to do with this card. Like, is it possible that this card is so old it can only read from two textures at once? I, I mean, that's really old, but, but that could be. Uh, the other problem is maybe I'm setting it up wrong. So maybe like I'm asking when I do that shader compile, um, I'm asking for the wrong name or something uh, or using the wrong, is it, are these written wrong? Peel zero, one, two, three sampler. Um, let's, let's just, I mean, I, let's just look at what that does when we compile it, right? Because I don't know. Let's just hop in here and see what we get. Um, so peel zero sampler and peel one sampler got non-values, but those were the two that were working. What? What is this? Oh, <laughs> that's okay. That's because we commented these other ones out. All right, that's fine. Uh, so yeah, so now we know that's definitely not the case because when it compiled it, it only did a read from one texture, right? Uh, it compiled those other ones out entirely. So it ain't that, right? Um, so let's see here. When we come through, uh, we don't want to be here. <laughs> we want to be back in here. Uh, so when we use this program, let's see if we're doing something stupid in the binder. Hello. There we go. Oops, I wanted to look at that. Uh, so here we go. We're going to call this successively with the GL uniform. Is that the correct GL uniform? It looks like it is because that's how we're binding these, right? Um, so that seems right where we just bind each one to the successively incrementing values. And then we just use like GL texture plus the peel index uh, to bind. Sure seems right to me. But the fact that it seems right doesn't super help us because it's seeming right and it being right are two very different things. Uh, and we are seeing a black screen.
So what's going on? Why can we only read from samplers 0 and 1, and when we read from 2 or 3, even if they're the only sampler, we see nothing? Uh, is this something that we've done incorrectly when we were storing the values at the beginning? Because, you know, we're kind of a little bit legacy at this point. Uh, when we do the, the render target index stuff, um, you know, are we do, were we storing these values in an inappropriate way? So global frame buffer textures, global frame buffer depths, uh, you know, did, did these get assigned in some kind of weird way uh, that doesn't work properly or, you know, who knows what here? I guess I can check that pretty easily by just looking at what that value actually is. Um, that would that would be pretty straightforward. So if I came in here, uh, I guess I could check this anywhere. I don't have to check it at the bind time, but I'm going to check it at the bind time anyway. Um, <clears throat> so if I come through here and, and we're taking a look at what we're binding, uh, what does global frame buffer textures look like? I mean, that looks pretty solid, right? 7, 9, 11, 13 is exactly, if they were just getting incremented, in, if they're just getting allocated in order, that's exactly what you would expect to see. Um, so for some reason, right, I can, I can blit it here. And if I blit it, it's good. If I copy it directly, it's not good. Uh, So one thing I do worry about a little bit is we're not setting the MIP map. So, I mean, we shouldn't really be getting... I, I'm just going to go ahead and make sure these get set. Um, so, you know, one thing that could be happening, I don't see why it would only happen for one and not the other one, is we could be getting a situation where it tries to do MIP map sampling, and since there are no MIP levels, it doesn't uh, properly do that. Um, yeah, so I don't know what's going on with that. That's a good question. So what I want to do here is, again, when we're creating these, I just want to make sure that when we sample from them, they're not getting MIP mapped uh, because we don't generate any MIP maps for them. It shouldn't have mattered because if we're seeing that none of them should be getting MIP mapped. Uh, but, you know, I don't know. I'm just worried about it, so that I'm going to do that anyway. Uh, so in here where we do, uh, after we've bound the texture, I'm going to set that parameter uh, just to ensure that it never it can never do that. right? Uh, so that just basically turns off any possible minification or magnification filters. Uh, and we'll see what happens. I don't feel like that should have anything to do with it, but I just, I don't, okay. Apparently it did. Uh, I have no explanation for why that was the case. I can only tell you that apparently those textures were trying to MIP and the other ones weren't or these got set somehow on textures, on the other texture handles prior, that's really weird. Uh, but turning off MIP fetches, it must have just been MIP fetches. Um, yeah, so, okay, that's fine, I guess. Uh, so coming through here, uh, let's just go ahead and, and see if we can re-enable some of these fetches here. So now can I fetch three correctly? Um, just wondering. So that looks like three pretty pretty good. Can I re-enable the uh, alpha adjustment for the background three? Um, I can. Uh, so that's good. Uh, and then I don't really know if that should be happening. We need to think about that math a little bit better. Uh, what happens if I actually come in here and try to um, uh, do the full blend? Uh, and, and did that, does that work? Uh, it does appear to work. 
Uh, and you know, everything looks quite nice, doesn't it? Uh, I gotta tell you, what if we were to turn off our, our render volumes here? Uh, have you have you have you wondered that question? If I was to just end if that, uh, looks like we still are drawing that one right there. Uh, but that's looking like a pretty respectable uh, rendering right now, to be completely honest with you. That's looking pretty darn good, folks. And I do think now we could play with that effect that I wanted to play with too, which is that, uh, that effect right there. Right? Uh, and so what I'm interested to see now is since we can play with alpha a little bit more, uh, suppose I was to make that be an alpha clip plane now. Uh, and so the way that we would do that, right, is the same way we were doing the fog before. Uh, and so, you know, in the OpenGL renderer, right, we would have, um, uh, we would have sort of the same stuff that we were doing with the fog, where we've got, uh, uh, where is it? So this bit right here, so we, we kind of have the like fog start distance, fog end distance, right? Uh, we would have a way of saying like, uh, you know, uh, clip alpha start distance and clip alpha end distance, you know? Uh, and those would, they would do exactly the same math. So where we have this fog distance here and we have the fog amount, we'd also have an alpha amount and it would do a clamp zero one map to range and it would be the clip alpha uh, start distance the fog distance clip alpha end distance and we're just taking another range there and producing just like we produced a fog value we produce an alpha value uh, and then what we can do is we <laughs> look we already were prepared to do it um, right uh, we, we already did exactly this um, uh, we're just going to take that alpha and multiply it by that <coughs> alpha, that fog-based alpha. Um, and so if we want to do that, right, we just need to add the ability to pass those down. So there's the uh, clip, what would I call it? Uh, clip alpha start distance and clip alpha. And so those, those uh, two values are now getting like remembered you know, uh, and uh, we can have those on here as just another thing that gets set, like so. And so in the render group, we would just put those into the setup, the render setup, and so it's literally just a copy. Um, and so you can kind of see like what I'm doing here. You would, if you had lots of shaders, this is the stuff that you would need to start automating. The ability to define something in a shader and set it somewhere else and not have to constantly do all the piping by hand because it, you know, it can definitely drag you down. I don't mind doing this by hand because I know we you know, don't really have very many shaders. But if we had 20 shaders, it would start to get uh, kind of onerous, right? And at that point, you kind of want to you know, do something a little more reasonable. Uh, so let's take a look at the fog start distance and the fog end distance stuff here. Uh, I'm going to set the clip alpha start distance and the clip alpha end distance. Um, I'm just going to yeah, set those to basically be nothing like they were before. And so the fog start distance, that stuff is just hard coded here, as you can kind of see. Uh, and so what I want to do is say, well, whatever the near clip plane is, is going to be uh, anytime we're doing that fog, the fogging. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say, all right, let's set the clip alpha start distance. We're going to set the clip alpha start distance to be the near clip plane, so it's right on there. Uh, and we're going to set the clip, clip alpha end distance uh, to be, 
you know, where we want it to actually start fading in. Uh, or, you know, which is, shouldn't, shouldn't be too far off, probably. I don't know. But we have an interesting thing here, which is that the start and end are kind of inverted. So we really want to do the opposite of that. Um, we want to map the range backwards. But we can just do that directly in the shader. So I don't really know how we want to do this. Uh, like, in other words, I think we could just do this, if that makes sense, because we want it to fade out as it gets close to us. I don't remember if the way we wrote it uh, will actually handle that or not. Um, so we'll find out in a second. But let's go ahead and quickly uh, just see if we can get this working before I go to the Q&A, because I'm just interested to see that effect. Uh, alpha amount is undefined. Right you are, sir. And we do apologize for that. Uh, what we could do here is just say, screw it. There we go. Uh, OK, so now we have to see whether we can get this effect working in, uh, in a reasonable way. We are actually passing down values now. And it doesn't really appear to be doing anything, right? Um, so that doesn't look particularly good. Uh, so what I want to do here is I want to play with this a little bit more. Uh, let's put it in the right order because maybe that clamp, that clamp probably doesn't work right if you specify them in the opposite order. I don't really know if that's true or not. We probably wrote the clamp wrong um, because we're, we're just dumb. Uh, so let's see if we come through here. Yeah, again, I'm, I'm not seeing any alpha there. So I'm not feeling very good about that. So just because I'm not really sure what's going on there, uh, I'm going to play with the shader a little bit directly first to get it working there because I would like to see what's happening uh, before I try to make sure that the piping is correct, which is a separate issue, right? Uh, so the first thing I want to do is, again, same black box debugging techniques. What I would like to do here is say, well, okay, uh, let's go back to the alpha amount concept. Uh, and we'll multiply by the alpha amount. And what I'm going to do is take that frag color. Uh, I want to take alpha amount and just reduce it uh, so it's always halved. So what I should see now is everything should go to half alpha, right? And it does. Uh, so that's pretty cool. And hey, check out how awesome this depth peeling is, right? Like, we just set everything to alpha and it worked. Like, the whole world is transparent and it basically works. Like, that's kind of nuts because we're not sorting anything. So that death feeling is just great for these 2D games. You've got the fill rate to spare. I kind of feel like you should just do it. Um, and you know, on a higher end hardware, you could use the atomics. But man, that's really compelling. You just throw it in there and it's like, hey, guess what? I sorted it for you. Happy birthday. Um, so anyway, obviously the alpha amount is working. So our problem here is that we're not uh, actually mapping this range correctly. Uh, and so let's try to figure out what's going on there. So I want to make the range go backwards. So basically, as we get further along the range, the alpha should get higher, right? Um, but actually, that's OK. So that's what should happen. So I think we're all right. So the clip alpha start distance should be you know, however far away we want to start from the camera. So let's say we start at 1 uh, and we go to 2. So that should give us some fog between 1 and 2, where it's alpha fog, so that the alpha of stuff should come in at that point. And it doesn't, which is just bizarre. Um, oh, pfft. I'm just stupid. I am Mr. Stupid Pants uh, the third. So that's just, yeah, that's just me being dumb. Duh, these aren't the near and far clip planes that we're using. So what we really want to do is take the near clip plane and set the alpha start to that. And then we want the near clip plane, which is actually pretty far out. It's not 0.1. Set the, set the near clip plane plus, you know, I don't know, a quarter meter. I'm not sure how far and we want to go for the alpha. Probably not far. Uh, anyway, uh, that should be now more correct. Of course, it still doesn't seem like it works, so that wasn't the problem. That is, was a problem, but not the problem, apparently. Uh, so let's go back here and, and see what happens. I'm going to start it pretty far out. So I'm going to start it at 4 and, and go to 5. 
And we should be able to get some alpha somewhere, right? Like somehow it's just not working at all. And I don't know why. Um, because it seems like we should be able to get some values in here in the alpha amount. And we know, you know, we know we're getting, we, we know that, that if we do get a value in the alpha that it does work. Because if we come in here and, and again, and we set alpha amount to 0.5, we do see alpha happen, right? I mean, it is the, the contributions happening. So somehow this clamp zero one map to range for the fog distance is never producing any actual alpha. So what if I just made it the entire, like a huge swath, right? And what's our near clip plane set to right now? Does anyone know? So the near clip plane is the near clip plane is set to five. So what if I just said start at the near clip plane of five and go to ten? That's a huge range. We should see alpha that or along the whole way. Okay, there we go. There we go. Um, so what's a little bit odd about that is if if five is the near clip plane and our alpha should be zero there, why are we still seeing anything? Um, and what I'm thinking is the problem there must be our frag color when we pass down the frag color. Ah, when we pass down the frag color, we're not taking account of pre-multiplied alpha. So really we need to multiply the entire fragment color by that alpha amount because it's pre-multiplied alpha. Lovely. That's what I wanted to see. Okay. So now let's back out these things to something that maybe should make some more sense. We had a couple of different stupidities in there. It was like a festival of stupid. Uh, so now let's see if we can get something working properly here. Uh, so if it starts, if the fog starts at the near clip plane, Start distance, end distance, um, and I don't know, extends for one unit. Presumably we should see an alpha band there. Mm, but we still don't. Hmm, I wonder why not. If I set this to five, and I set this to 10, what happens? Still nothing. So here's a question. Am I setting those properly? In my haste, did I forget to actually set those? I probably did, didn't I? Yep. Nice job, dude. The festival of stupidity continues. There we go. Do, do, do. Oops. Which, by the way, is another reason why you want to automate these kinds of processes if you're doing a lot of them, because it's easy to make a stupid error like that. All right. Uh, so that's better. And uh, clip alpha start distance now should properly be able to be set. Uh, based on the near clip plane so that whatever you set it to it will fade out near the near clip plane um, like so. Uh, so now the problem we have is the near clip plane is actually fading those things out a little bit too early, right? Um, so we probably do want to tighten this up a little bit and we maybe need to put the near clip plane uh, a little bit uh, further back to, I don't know, um, So that's a pretty interesting effect. And so now the other thing that I'm thinking, right, uh, is I think we might also be able to improve upon that, uh, upon that technique a little further as well. Um, like I think we may be able to make it do some smarter stuff uh, with 
with respect to like fading out things that maybe we don't quite want to uh, maybe we don't quite want a depth peel as much. Um, but yeah. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and go to the Q&A. So it doesn't seem to quite line up with the near clip plane because if you look, it's like it's weird. The the near clip plane is like clipping stuff out. Oh yeah, you know why that would be too? The reason the near clip plane is clipping stuff out is actually because the near clip plane is gonna clip without regard to the Z bias. So That suggests, let's see here, or with regard to the Z bias, I should say. So if I come in here, I'm just curious to see, uh, how did we actually do this fog amount? Fog distance is the Z vertex X, Y, Z. So the one that modified minus, minus the fog direction. And that's not actually the one getting pushed down. Now that with that should make us fog out faster though so that's a little bit strange to me um, but it does suggest that what we really need to do here in terms of near far clip plane is we actually need to take that near clip plane and bring it back in and do something where we leave enough of a distance for the bias to clear it right um, so I think we actually want to do something here, like possibly even this much. I think we want something like this. Um, We do get some, some gunk in there. But we're getting there. Um... Could you try disabling the randomization of the ground tile Z? I'm interested to see if that'll adversely affect the sexiness of the depth peel. Uh, I think it would definitely make the depth peel less interesting. I mean, it also makes the visuals less interesting. You know what I mean? Uh, one of the reasons I wanted those uneven, like those tiles like that is because it just looks better and it, can, it gives the player understanding of where the tiles are in a nice 3D way, instead of only making it be, uh, about like a tile bitmap or something. Uh, but yeah, if you just want to see it become less sexy, uh, we can totally do that by just taking out this. So now we're just a flat plane there, um, right? Well, <laughs> it's still kind of cool, honestly. Um, so it's, it's cooler than I thought it would be, um, I guess. Uh, the debug menu is broken now. Uh, yeah, so um, 
I feel like probably the clip alpha stuff is uh, needs to be not like we need a way of turning off the clip alpha uh, because the clip alpha is going to zero out um, the stuff in the debunk menu. So I guess the one way to do that would be here is we just say like, hey, the clip alpha distance is actually like um, the far clip plane. Or something. Uh, I think that probably work. Uh, I don't really know. No, that did not work. Uh, okay, how would we do that? Um, I feel like that should have worked okay. I guess I don't technically know that it's that uh, either, so I should just double check. So here's without uh, that, yeah, and that's, so it, it is the clip alpha uh, that that creates the problem. So you want this to clip to one point, oh, right, uh, I said it the wrong way, sorry. It, it needs to be the near clip plane. So it needs to be like near clip plane, you know, minus something. because you always want everything that's drawn to be like in front of the end, you know? Uh, so there you go. Pragma script says, for depth peeling, would it be possible to discard all pixels in the second layer that have an alpha value of 255 in, in the front layer because they are not interesting for the composition anyway? Uh, yes. We absolutely could. Uh, if we just wanted to save like fill rate, we could totally do that. Um, unfortunately, I don't really know how you would do that. Um, without a little bit of work. So you don't get to use the, like, I guess the question would be, how do we pipe that alpha value over there though? Because since we're drawing into separate buffers, we don't actually have the alpha value of what's in the other depth field buffer. So we'd have to pipe that buffer in and actually read from it. So I worry that the amount of savings you would get from not doing the right might be offset from having to have a whole other texture query happen on every pixel. So it's not great, you know. Uh, so I'm interested to know, you can see we still get some problems there with the depth peeling, um, right, where you still get some black uh, sort of crunkiness there. And I do wonder uh, if we can improve that further. I think we definitely have some problems with the alpha clip uh, stuff. So we need to do some work on this. Probably next weekend we'll just do some finishing work on these shaders and stuff and try to get it really dialed because we still got some bugs. Uh, we still got some, some definitely some bugs in there. Alex Kelbo, I'm behind on day 130, just finished the SIMD thread introduction. What feature of the game eventually forced you to use the GPU? Totally love the software rendering. Um, 
I think it's because I wanted to do pure, I wanted to do actual 3D. I don't remember, to be honest. Uh, we will definitely go back and do a software renderer for the final version as well, um, so that you can still switch between them, right? Uh, so we'll go back and do like a depth peeling one. If that turns out to be the final way we render, uh, we'll do one of those. Where can you go? There's nowhere to go. There's no more stairs. Stairs to nowhere. It's the bridge to nowhere. Um, but I don't remember what it was. It may have also been a speed issue. Like we may have been like we wanted to do something speed wise that we couldn't do. I don't remember. I really couldn't tell you. Somebody probably Niblo might know better than I do. Uh, but it would be pretty easy to now to do um, a software rasterizer if we, you know, choose if we have it exactly this way in the future, uh, because, you know, we know exactly what we need to do now, and we have everything baked down to a pretty good process. So we could probably, you know, I don't want to do it now because we may still change some things about the rendering as we go because we're still kind of fl flexible in that way, but. Is the game going to be more 3D-ish gameplay-wise than originally planned? Uh, no, it's still just totally 2D. Um, so it's it's not going to change gameplay-wise at all. Uh, it just, I just feel like it plays and feels better when things are rendered in 3D for whatever reason. Um, even with sprites, they just feel it just feels like a more coherent world to me when the camera moves around and you get a little bit of that depth, you know. And Napoleon, yes, death peeling is being used for object uh, for uh, order independent transparency with the sprites. Um, the only problem we have right now is we don't have a discriminator for depth interpenetration. So, like, if two shadows are rendered at the exact same layer, uh, exact same Z, and they overlap, um, you get a problem. You get a bug. Uh, so we, I don't know what we want to do about that in the future. Like, I don't know how we want to approach eliminating some of the artifacting there. Um, probably not something I care about right now. Like everything looks good enough right now that I'm like, okay, we can put the real art in here. We can get the game all good and like playable and fun and all that stuff. And then at the end, we can go back and go, all right, how are we going to iron out the last few of his view bugs and so on? Uh, can you go into more detail on what fixed layers two and three from being all black? It wasn't an old card, only being able to read two textures, but I missed the actual resolution. Uh, yeah, so... Sorry about that. I didn't really explain it very well at the time because it's kind of a well-known bug amongst people who program OpenGL. So you're just like, yep, that, it's that one again. Um, by default, when OpenGL starts up, uh, it assumes that textures are mip-mapped. It assumes that they're mip-mapped. So even if a texture has never had any MIP level specified and will never have any MIP level specified, OpenGL considers it MIP mapped until you tell it otherwise. What this means is that if the texture ever gets sampled, 
in a way that it thinks it needs to sample from one of the MIP maps of the texture instead of the actual texture, you will just get black samples because there are no MIP maps to the texture. So basically, we've only specified one MIP level, MIP level zero, or rather, no MIP levels, the base texture, right? It hasn't been MIPed down. So depending on how you want to use the terminology, level zero is the only zero that's present. So if the card ever wants to sample from level one for some reason, it would get nothing because there's no data there. Now, the reason I didn't suspect that right away is because I would have assumed all the peels were at the same MIP level, but apparently that's not true for some reason. And either that reason is because there's some weird bug going on in the driver, or I don't know what, or somehow the, the fact that we wanted no MIP, that we wanted term MIP mapping off got set on text, the first two textures and not on the, the third and fourth for some reason. I don't know how that could be possible either. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. So basically what I would say is right now, I couldn't tell you why only two and three were doing that, but I can tell you that what fixed it was turning off the MIP mapping. So it seems like it was some kind of a weird bug there in terms of like thinking it was supposed to sample from the map. It shouldn't have thought it was supposed to sample from the MIP map. So that's weird too because we are sampling basically one-to-one. -one. Uh, so I really don't know. Uh, but that's what fixed it, is turning off the MIP mapping. Uh, and the way that we did that was just setting the filter to GL linear, because um, it defaults to MIP map linear. MIP, MIP linear, texel linear, right? Do you actually have to have wireframe models to be considered 2.5D, or would this count as well? Um, so 2.5D, I would say that that is not a really well-defined term in the industry, honestly. But I would suspect that, yes, this is 2.5D, because there are actual 3D objects in here. Um, and everything is actually placed in 3D for real. So that's basically what 2.5D is, I think. Like 2.5D is basically saying some things are 3D, some things are 2D, is typically how I interpret that phrase. You know, like Doom or something would be 2.5D potentially, right? It does some things in a 3D way and some things in a 2D way, and off you go. Even Quake could be considered 2.5D in a sense. Um, oh, wait, no, it couldn't, because they, they, they did full 3D in Quake. Uh, so is there a 2.5D game like Quake? I'm trying to think if there's a game that rendered environments in 3D uh, and the sprites in 2D. There probably was a few of those, but I can't think of them offhand. So there's a bunch of 2.5D sorts of things like that, and I suspect we would fall into that category, but I don't know. It's not a real precise term. <laughs> you could re define your own render definition for handmade hero um, or for handmade development. Uh, yeah, I guess what I would say is I don't know that it, it's a really useful t thing to categorize stuff as anyway. I mean, this is a 3D renderer. It renders things in 3D. Some of those things happen to be sprite cards, but that's true in almost all 3D renderers. Like, even fully the most 3D thing you mean, like Battlefield 1 or whatever the most recent like fancy graphics thing you've seen probably uses sprite cards somewhere for like particle systems or something, right? So I feel like really Handmade Hero for all intents and purposes at this point is a 3D game, right? And it's a 3D game that uses 2D sprite graphics in a bunch of places, but it's basically all 3D. Um, so I don't even know that it makes a difference. 2.5D, 3D, I don't know. 2.5D might be better reserved for things like Doom where you can't rotate the camera. Like, we can rotate our camera, right? 
Um, Alex Kelbo, is the floor below us being drawn completely and the one we are on top of, and the one we are on, on top of it, or is the one below being clipped so that only the pixels we see through the holes are drawn? Um, so right now, we do not do anything to try and do clipping to holes. Uh, so the whole bottom floor is being rendered. And my, uh, you know, assumption is that we will never really have a fill rate problem on Handmade Hero. And maybe, you know, if we do have a fill rate problem, my anticipation is it's gonna come from something like a, a orgy of particle effects, which we would want to address in a different way anyway, that wouldn't have a lot to do with layer clipping like that. Because we're just not gonna be stressing the fill rate of the card that much, I don't think. Even this old card is not really caring about the fact that we're overfilling the screen four times. Uh, and four times, times four times, basically, right? Like 16 times, and it's just like, whatever. Um, so I don't think we're really going to stress the fill rate that much unless we get a particle system orgy in here. All right, I'm going to wrap it up. All right, thank you everyone for joining me for the episode of Handmade Hero. It's been a pleasure coding with you as always. If you want to follow along the series at home, you can always pre-order the game on handmadehero.org, and it comes with all the source code so you can play around with it. We also have a forum site you can go to if you want to ask questions. We have a Patreon page if you want to support the video series. Uh, schedule bot if you want to know when we're going to be live. And an episode guide that you can go to uh, if you want to catch up on old episodes. That's about it for this week. Um, I don't remember what the schedule is for next week, but check the schedule bot. I'll post it Friday. Uh, we will basically just do some cleanup next week. And then I think we are on to art integration. Uh, so I think we'll start working on how we're going to plan to get the new art in here uh, because we kind of have like everything penciled in. Uh, the camera works just fine. You know, we got plenty of work to do to improve it and all that stuff, but uh, everything works pretty good. So I think at this point we want to start building out, um, you know, actual game looking stuff uh, and starting to see like what we're missing. You know, basically see like, you know, what do we need to improve in the engine that's based on just actual stuff uh, that we're doing. So hopefully, um, you know, uh, hopefully we will uh, find that we've done a good job giving ourselves a, a toolkit for, for putting the game together. Uh, and those things that we haven't built yet, uh, we can find good ways to build. That's about it for this week. I will catch everyone next week. Until then, have fun programming, and I'll see everyone on the internet. Take it easy, everyone.